A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. On a warm fall evening in 2002, Gabriel Polk was waiting for his father to come home from work. The two had plans to see the San Francisco Giants play later that night, and Gabriel was really looking forward to it. His father, Felix Polk, a well-known psychologist in the Bay Area, was not answering his calls. It was rare for him not to follow through on plans with his son. It was also out of the ordinary for him not to call Gabe and let him know that he would be late. At 8.30 that night, Gabriel anxiously called 911. When the operator asked why he needed the police, rather than answer, Gabriel hung up the phone. This was not the first time that week that police received a phone call from the Polk's home. Just four days before, Felix had filed a police report claiming that his wife had threatened to shoot him. Gabriel began searching for the business card the officer had given to his father that day, believing he might be the best one to call now. But he could not find his card. So Gabriel went to look in the guest house adjacent to their pool, where his father had been staying temporarily. What he found in there prompted him to flee back to the main house and call 911 again. When the operator picked up, the only word that Gabriel was able to voice in that moment was murder. From Wondery and Tree Fort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is part one of two about Susan Polk. Orinda is a small city only 20 minutes from downtown San Francisco. The beauty and location of the town has made it a draw for the wealthy who might want to escape city living but not be too far from it. Susan and Felix Polk lived in a rustic California estate in Orinda where they raised their three boys. Late in the evening on Sunday, October 13th, 2002, the house was quiet as 44-year-old Susan Polk walked down the narrow corridor leading to the pool house. Armed with a can of pepper spray, a heavy mag flashlight, and a four-inch kitchen paring knife, Susan was prepared for battle. She intended to confront her husband of 21 years about his domineering control of her life. Her husband, Felix, a 70-year-old Berkeley psychotherapist, should have anticipated the attack. The couple was going through a very contentious divorce, and Susan had demonstrated increasingly hostile behavior towards him. Four nights prior, Susan had returned from her new home in Montana, ostensibly to collect more of her personal belongings. However, while she was away, a divorce hearing was held in her absence, and the judge had drastically reduced her alimony and given Felix temporary custody of their youngest son, Gabriel. 
Convinced that Felix controlled the judge, Susan became livid when he informed her of the new financial and custody rulings. In fact, she told him that she was going to blow his head off with a shotgun. Upon her arrival in Arenda, she moved Felix's belongings into the pool house. His lawyer and the police advised that if he was going to foolishly remain on the property, he should barricade the doors. But Felix did not heed their warnings and refused to leave the house. On that night, when Susan entered the guest house through an open door, she found Felix dressed only in black briefs, reading a book in an overstuffed chair. Susan hit him in the head with the flashlight and stabbed him 27 times. Forensic investigators could not determine at what point she bashed Felix on the side of his head, but they know he fought back. Furniture was overturned, an ottoman tossed across the room, and there were tangles of Susan's hair pulled from the roots and twined in his fingers. Felix's hands had deep lacerations, and two of his fingertips were almost completely severed. He ultimately bled to death from all of the stab wounds. Later, Susan would admit that after she watched her husband die, she sat down in the room and debated what to do. She knew that calling the police would be problematic, even if she pleaded self-defense. If she were arrested, there would be no one to take care of Gabriel. So she returned back to the main house. She showered, washed her clothes, and before she went to bed, Susan threw the flashlight into the outside garbage bin. It was scheduled for a pickup in the morning. She also cleaned the paring knife and returned it to the kitchen drawer. Clearly, Susan does not watch 48 hours. The next morning, Susan went through her normal routine, getting Gabriel breakfast and driving him to school. After she returned home, she drove Felix's car to the local train station commuter lot. Then Susan walked the two miles back to the house. At 12.30, after she picked Gabriel up from school and took him home, Gabriel noticed that his father's car was not there. Over the next several hours, he called his dad's cell phone and office repeatedly, trying to reach him. At 8.30 p.m., Gabriel asked his mother if she knew the whereabouts of his father. Susan answered, I don't know. Maybe he got into an accident. Why don't you call the highway patrol and see if there's a problem? Gabriel suspected she was lying. He felt compelled to check the pool house, but found the door locked. It was too hard to get to the side doors in the dark. He confronted his mother again, asking her where his father was. She responded, aren't you glad he's gone? To which Gabriel snapped back a vehement no. For four years, Susan had been building a case against Felix. She told Gabriel and his brother Eli, who at the time were 11 and 13, that Felix had been using his skills as a psychotherapist to hypnotize and manipulate them. However, she was never able to sway her oldest son, Adam. Adam, a sophomore at UCLA, would later tell police that his mother, and I quote, acted fine 80% of the time and delusional the other 20%. Although she might have been delusional, Susan was very clear the many times that she warned Felix and her sons that she was going to drug, drown, run over, or shoot her husband. But she repeated these threats so often that the men in her family just tuned her out. So when Gabriel first called 911 and the operator started asking questions, he felt maybe he was being alarmist. Susan overheard him on the phone and asked why he was calling the police. 
he ignored her and went back to the guest house with a flashlight, determined to find the business card of the police officer that his father had spoken with just days before. This time, Gabriel got in through the kitchen door of the pool house. He froze for a moment, taking in the scene. His father was on his back in a pool of dried blood. His eyes were open and fixed, his mouth agape, and his skin drained of color. Gabriel fled to retrieve the cordless phone in his bedroom and get help. That was when he called 911, alerting them to the murder. He told the operator, I think my mother shot my dad. When the officers arrived, Susan claimed to have no knowledge of where Felix was. After finding his body in the guest house, they reported back to Susan that he was dead. Oh, well, she said, we were getting a divorce anyway. Susan May Polk was born in Glendale, California in 1957. When she was born, her father, Dick Bowling, was in law school and her mother, Helen, worked part-time to help support the family. When her father graduated, he left her mother for another woman. Susan was just five years old and she was devastated her relationship with her father would grow more and more distant as the years passed. After the marriage ended, Helen moved with her children to an apartment and rented out the family home for extra income. They were forced to move several times, downgrading the apartment's size and quality each time. By 1967, the family of three were living in Oakland, California, Susan and her older brother David were both highly intelligent and gifted students, but neither of them enjoyed school. Her mother later reflected that Susan, quote, did not know how to smile and make everyone feel accepted. When Susan was 15, the family moved to Concord. Susan had a two-mile walk to school and felt anxious about the growing amount of cat calls she received from the older boys. Although her body was maturing, Susan was not interested in boys or the high school scene. She found school boring. She preferred to stay home reading Dostoevsky, which is what she did the majority of the time. Although Susan's mom had never graduated high school, she instilled in her children that education was the way out of their financial and social situation. She read them the Russian classics and was very happy when they became Susan's favorite stories as well. However, Susan became so immersed in her books that she stopped making an effort to communicate with the outside world. Susan wrote in an essay that she felt as though she was in a different dimension than other people, speaking a different language. She said, and I quote, I talked not of what was essential to me. I did not feel what I spoke of had real meaning. I spoke of only what was superficial to me, what was not important to me. I ceased to communicate what was the content of my thoughts. At a parent-teacher conference in 1972, her mother learned that Susan had been skipping school and staying home. The school recommended that Susan see Dr. Felix Polk, a psychotherapist who specialized in troubled adolescents. He had received his PhD in psychology from UC Berkeley and had a large private practice. This recommendation would change Susan's life forever. Felix Frank Polk was born in Vienna, Austria in 1932 to wealthy and educated parents, just a few moments after his twin brother, John. The Polks owned and operated luxury clothing stores founded by Felix's maternal grandparents. 
they had a large home that was staffed with a cook, housekeeper, chauffeur, and nannies. Felix was very close to his nanny, Katya, who was very loving and warm to him. She was much closer to him than his own mother, who held Felix at arm's length and seemed to favor his twin brother more. The Polks were Jewish, but not observant. However, that mattered little to the Nazis when they invaded Vienna. They arrested Felix's father in 1938 and forced the Polks to surrender their family business. Six-year-old Felix watched as his father was beaten and carted away by the Nazis. This traumatizing event was followed by months of terror while his family tried to get visas to go to France. Felix and his brother were even baptized with the hope that would help them obtain their exit visas. Compounding Felix's fears was his heartbreak at having to leave behind his beloved nanny, Katya. Felix later said that he never got over that loss. Felix, his twin brother, older sister, and mother eventually reunited with their father. Felix would recall this time later as a period of hunger, fear, and uncertainty. As they journeyed through France trying to stay one step ahead of the Nazis, Felix's father was separated once again from his family when he joined the French army. The family reunited once again and this time decided to make the journey to America to rebuild their lives. In November of 1941, the Polks arrived on a ship in the New York Harbor. The family soon moved to Harrison, New York, where his parents reestablished themselves. The family never talked about the trauma they experienced in Europe, but for Felix, the pain was still there. To the outside world, Felix was quiet and uncomfortably shy. Like Susan, Felix was a voracious reader and got lost in his books. Although he was a good student, Felix was always in the shadow of his twin brother, John, who excelled at both school and athletics. His parents endlessly compared him to his twin brother, And even when Felix earned a scholarship to St. John's College to study literature, his accomplishment was eclipsed by his brother, who also won a scholarship, but his was to MIT. When Felix graduated in 1953, he enlisted in the Navy, as it was required of all men his age to serve two years in the military. But Felix continued to be withdrawn anxious and depressed. While on leave, he began seeing a psychiatrist and admitted feelings of intense guilt over masturbation. He also confessed to being preoccupied by incestuous fantasies of his older sister since adolescence. In October of 1955, his anxiety and depression overwhelmed him. A friend of his became extremely worried when he became inconsolably sad and she could not reach him. She called the police to check on him and they found Felix unconscious from carbon monoxide poisoning. He had attempted to fill the family garage with car exhaust and kill himself. Naval doctors diagnosed him with major depression as well as schizophrenic reaction, a term that is not used often now. Because of his lack of recovery, he ended up being confined to a mental hospital for a year. Upon his release, Felix was set up on a date with his future wife, Sharon, a trained concert pianist. She was very charismatic and seemed to bring Felix out of his shell. They married in 1959, and he enrolled in Yeshiva University to earn a master's degree in sociology. The couple then moved to California so that Felix could earn a Ph.D. in psychology from UC Berkeley. Felix felt that psychotherapists had, quote, more power to impact the lives of their patients than sociologists. 
He had been deeply impacted by the analysis and care he had received in the years since his psychotic break and felt he could do the same thing for others. By the mid-1960s, Felix had set up a private therapy practice. He and Sharon had two children, a son and a daughter, and by all appearances, they were a successful cosmopolitan family. However, Felix admitted to a friend that he was tired of Sharon being the dominant partner in their relationship. He filed for divorce, but did not leave Sharon until five years later due to his emotional dependence on her. This was a common theme for Felix's relationships with women. I'll discuss that more when we talk about his relationship with 15-year-old Susan. Sharon was the exact opposite of Susan, which may have been why Felix left Sharon for her. He could not dominate Sharon, but he certainly dominated Susan to the nth degree. By the late 60s, Felix had become a popular professor at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Family Psychology. His colleagues reported that he enjoyed a guru-like status among its students. He was so popular and trusted that the Catholic Archdiocese sent him their, quote, wayward priests and troubled nuns. Berkeley reflected the progressive social culture of the Bay Area in the 60s and 70s. Its faculty adopted new fads in their therapeutic practices, such as hypnosis, reenactment therapy, and dream analysis. Felix was respected by most of his peers, but he was also known for some unconventional practices that some fellow psychologists considered inappropriate. Specifically, Felix believed in sharing his personal life with his patients. Felix saw himself as the patient's friend, and he became very involved in their lives, and they became very involved with his. He regularly socialized with them outside the clinical setting. Patients came to his home for dinner and babysat for him. One patient was a concert pianist who gave Felix's children piano lessons. He also created patient groups and encouraged gatherings outside of group therapy. There are several very good reasons why therapists should not socialize with their patients. According to an article written by psychologist Leonard Holmes, your therapist should not be your close friend because that would create what's called a dual relationship. A dual relationship occurs when two people are in two very different types of relationships at the same time. Why is this a problem? Because a problem in one relationship can cause problems in the other. For example, if you are mad your therapist didn't come to your birthday party, it will be hard for you to open up in the therapeutic setting. In 1967, Felix became a convert of EST, or Earhart's Seminar Training, also known as EST. EST was founded in 1971 by Werner Earhart, also known as John Paul Rosenberg, a former used car salesman with no background in psychology. Over a six days and 60 hour course, Werner taught that an individual is responsible for all that happens to them and that a person has the power to be anyone they want. He taught that you could, quote, reprogram your mind, repair broken beliefs about yourself, and create the life you want. Participants in this grueling seminar would often be in sessions from 9 a.m. till past midnight with only one meal break. The most important part of the training was to recognize and, quote, experience one's recurrent patterns and problems and choosing to change them. This was how one could free themselves from their past. For Felix, Est was transformational. The concept of being guilt-free 
also made it easier for Felix to ignore critics of his hands-on psychological approach. In 1972, 15-year-old Susan Bowling walked into Dr. Polk's office. She was a bright, though troubled teenager who had profound issues with authority. But Felix's warmth and love of Russian literature won her over. But therapy was not an immediate cure for Susan. According to Carol Pogosh's book about Susan Polk, Seduced by Madness, she still refused to go to school, a decision which, strangely enough, Dr. Polk supported. And about a month after she started therapy, she was sentenced to a month in juvenile hall for shoplifting a dress. She ran away to Oakland and lived with a friend for a month before calling her mother and coming home. A letter from Felix to the courts helped her to not go back to juvenile hall. I think he was grooming her, coming to her rescue and giving her exactly what she wanted. Not surprisingly, Susan became enraptured by her therapist, and Felix continued to impress upon her that they were very much alike. While it is normal for a patient to idolize their therapist, Susan's feelings went way beyond that. When she would come for her sessions, he would talk with her about literature. He would stroke her hair and tell her she was beautiful. Susan was a young girl, and her whole world began to revolve around Dr. Felix Polk. When Susan told her mother that she sometimes sat on Dr. Polk's lap during sessions, Helen thought this was odd, but decided it might be a new therapeutic practice. After all, Dr. Polk came highly recommended. But her mother might have objected if she had known about another one of Dr. Polk's exercises with Susan, the hypnosis sessions. Felix would serve Susan hot tea and had her lie on the floor. He would count backwards from 100 while she slipped into an unconscious state. Susan would later state that she had no memories of what happened while she was on the floor. This was not hypnosis at all. I've been hypnotized numerous times, and you remember everything. What Felix was doing was drugging Susan, probably with a type of date rape drug that caused amnesia. That's what those drugs do. Felix's behavior can be boiled down to three words, domination, manipulation, and control. And he was exerting all of that on a very troubled and vulnerable teenage girl. After she was arrested for shoplifting in 1974, she overdosed on her mother's prescription of diazepam, a minor sedative. It's not clear whether this was a real attempt at suicide or a cry for attention. Her mother found her and Susan had her stomach pumped. She was then held in a mental health ward until Felix, once again, wrote a letter on her behalf. Felix was able to convince the attending physician to release the teenager from the hospital and place her under his supervision. Felix would parade Susan around to his psychology students and conduct therapy sessions with her in front of them. She was young and beautiful and obviously worshipped him, and she loved being his prized patient. He touted her as the girl he had, quote, cured of schizophrenia. Now, notwithstanding the shameful show Felix was putting on for his students, Susan was never schizophrenic, and there is no cure for it anyway. There's only treatment. Schizophrenia is a severe thought disorder characterized by bizarre delusions and auditory hallucinations. Based on my 10 years in clinical psychiatry, I came to see it as the most 
devastating and hideous mental illness known to mankind. Many people suffering from this have great difficulty concentrating and accomplishing day-to-day tasks. Reading and comprehending a novel would be impossible. And though Susan did have issues come up later in her life that would be described as delusional, her problem was not schizophrenia, and it never was. So what does this say about Felix? He was grandstanding at the risk of his own patient. If I didn't already think that Felix was a horrible therapist, that alone would have sealed the deal. When she was 18, Susan told her mother she was in love with a doctor. When Helen realized it was Dr. Polk, she went to him and asked him to leave her daughter alone. Helen tried to get her daughter interested in young men, but Susan remained fixated on Dr. Polk. Susan later said that by the time she was 18 or 19, she and Felix had fallen in love and were having sex during therapy on the floor of his office. Now, there are so many issues here that I can't go into them all. However, I will speak about transference. Transference in therapy is the ability to unconsciously redirect feelings and desires from one person to another. For example, you may observe characteristics of your father in a new boss. You may attribute fatherly feelings to this new boss or negative feelings depending on the relationship you had with your father. Transference in therapy happens when a patient attaches anger, hostility, or love, adoration, or a host of other possible feelings on to their therapist or doctor. And let's not forget, Susan was deeply wounded at the age of only five when her beloved father left her behind while divorcing her mother. The transference of all Susan's unresolved feelings, the longing for daddy's love and acceptance, probably fit Felix Polk like a fine tailored suit. But wait, there's more. While the phenomenon of transference is a widely accepted and respected concept in the field of psychotherapy, the therapist must be ever vigilant that their own feelings and unresolved conflicts and issues not be projected onto the client. And this phenomenon is known as countertransference. If this happens and the therapist is projecting their emotions and subconscious thoughts onto the patient, it can create problems for the patient and their sessions. When you think about it, the therapist is supposed to be the adult in the room, right? So to speak. Countertransference can actually be harmful if the therapist uses their patient to meet their own psychological needs. Remember, a contributing factor to Felix's severe depression and psychotic episode in the Navy was the intense guilt he felt about his incestuous, masturbatory fantasies of his sister when she was 15, Susan's age when he met her and became her therapist. Felix and Susan did not try to hide their feelings for one another. Colleagues and students both noted there was something going on between the two of them. Eventually, word got to his wife, Sharon, that Felix was sleeping with his 18-year-old patient. Furious, she stormed into Felix's office and berated the other therapist there for not stopping it. Needless to say, Felix and Sharon soon divorced. At Felix's suggestion, Susan enrolled in Mills College, an exclusive private school in the Oakland Hills, and continued to see him as a patient. She dropped out of Mills and eventually enrolled in San Francisco State. By 1978, she was enjoying living on campus and being independent. She told Felix she wanted to end their relationship. But when he threatened to commit suicide, 
she decided to stay. In the 1960s and 70s, there were no established rules about a therapist-patient relationship. In fact, Carl Jung had affairs with many of his patients. And in the 1970s, there were some schools of thought that believed sex between a therapist and patient was beneficial to both parties. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The Society for Psychotherapy describes it this way. Sexual intimacies between mental health professionals and their clients are considered one of the most immoral acts within the profession. More importantly, such acts can cause damage to the client's mental health, emotional health, and well-being. Specifically, when intentionally and knowingly a therapist violates their patient's trust, as they do when they decide to become sexually involved with them, the effects on the patient's ability to trust can be profound and lasting. And that certainly was the case for Susan. But it wasn't until 1992 that sex with a patient was deemed to be unethical by the California Psychological Association. Today, it is illegal in most states, including California. According to the American Association of Psychologists website, quote, it is highly unethical for psychologists to form personal relationships with patients outside of therapy because it would create a dual relationship where the relationship is twofold and the dynamics of one would impact the other. We've talked about that. The American Counseling Association and the Association of Clinical Psychologists have a clear code of ethics regarding dual relationships. According to the ACA, and I quote, a non-professional dual relationship has the potential to blur the boundaries between a counselor and a client, create a conflict of interest, enhance the potential for exploitation and abuse of power, and or cause the counselor and client to have different expectations of therapy. In Carol Polgosh's book, she spoke to Dr. Margaret Singer, a former teacher of Felix's and an expert on brainwashing. Dr. Singer favors a clear boundary between patients and therapists. She warns that, quote, you don't have a dual relationship. The therapist does not become the landlord or the lover because a person puts onto therapy all the most positive hopes they can gather. Then when a therapist lets the patient down or violates them, it's terrible. Felix should have heeded his teacher's warnings. At some point, he must have let Susan down because the fallout for him was tremendous. In fact, it ended his life. Instead, he chose to go all in on his relationship with Susan. And on Christmas Day, 1981, 24-year-old Susan Bowling married 50-year-old Felix Polk. But this tale did not end up happily ever after, And this was not the end of Susan and Felix's story. Join us next week as we talk about the factors that drove Susan to kill Felix and learn how Satanism, cocaine, and Cocoa Puffs all factored into the murder of Felix Polk. When I was growing up, my brothers and I really looked forward to Saturday mornings we would wake up and my mother would have what we like to call a sugar breakfast. My two older brothers would usually choose pancakes or bacon and eggs, but my younger brother and I would opt for Frosted Flakes cereal, called Sugar Frosted Flakes back then. You remember the commercials? A cartoon tiger named Tony would always say they're great at the end of the spot. 
I also really liked a cereal called Cocoa Puffs, which was basically little balls of rice and corn covered in chocolate. For some reason, my dad drew the line at this cereal. Even though Frosted Flakes had just as much sugar, maybe it was the chocolate for breakfast that threw him. I don't know. Probably so. He was a conservative guy. Coco Puffs had a mascot named Sonny the Cuckoo Bird, who, by the way, looked nothing like a cuckoo bird. In the commercials, Sonny would try desperately to stay focused on whatever task he was doing, but would inevitably lose his concentration. Everything he did would remind him of his favorite cereal. Sonny would devolve from a seemingly normal bird a normal bird who talked, that is, into a frenetic animal. His eyes would roll around and he would flip uncontrollably, the whole time yelling, I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. This was, of course, adapted by kids as a way to call out a peer when they were acting wild or strange, or to describe someone who they felt was, for lack of a better word, crazy. Adam Polk, the first son of Susan and Felix, took the witness stand during the trial for the murder of his father. He had to tolerate his father's accused murderer, who was representing herself, cross-examine him for days. During the third day, Adam's patience had run out. After a particularly outrageous question, Adam finally lost his cool. You're bonkers, he said. You're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. This outburst and the laughter in the courtroom did not deter the defense. Neither did the fact that the accused murderer, Susan Polk, was cross-examining her own son. We talked about Susan Polk's tumultuous childhood leading up to the murder of her husband, Felix. I would recommend that you check out that episode before listening to this one. But as a reminder, Susan Polk met her future husband, Felix, when she was just 15. She was his patient. Felix was a prominent psychologist who specialized in treating adolescents. We ended the previous episode when she married Felix. She was 24 years old. He was 50. In 1983, two years after their wedding, their first son, Adam, was born. After his birth, Susan became obsessed with her son's safety. When Adam was 18 months old, he bit the tail of the family dog. Susan interpreted this as a sign that Adam had been subjected to satanic rituals at his daycare. She maintained that after she had dropped him off, Adam had been whisked away to a warehouse, put in a cage, and made to watch other babies being sexually assaulted and tortured. Now, some of you might be scratching your head, thinking, how could anyone believe that? Well, in the mid-1980s, there was a pervasive fear that ran through America that very young children were in grave peril from adults that practiced Satanism, also known as devil worshipers. This bizarre belief claimed that there were practicing Satanists everywhere, They believed these Satanists worked in schools, daycare centers, churches, hospitals, the FBI, CIA, local sheriff's departments, medical centers, etc. They were convinced these Satanists kidnapped very young children, flew them on airplanes or bused them to warehouses or churches where they sexually assaulted them in the most horrible ways. They thought the Satanists sacrificed and cannibalized the children or buried them alive. And they believed all of this with no evidence 
at all. I'm not kidding. This pervasive and malignant belief, in hindsight, developed a name, the Satanic Panic. This is defined now as a moral panic and consists of over 12,000 unsubstantiated cases of Satanic ritual abuse, also known as SRA. Starting in the United States in the 1980s, it spread throughout many parts of the world by the late 90s. And in some areas, it still persists even today. The panic originated in 1980 with the publication of Michelle Remembers, a book co-written by Canadian psychiatrist Lawrence Pazder and his patient and future wife, Michelle Smith. The book used the now discredited practice of recovered memory therapy to make sweeping, lurid claims about Smith's supposed experience with satanic ritual abuse. After the book's release, allegations arose throughout much of the United States and involved reports of physical and sexual abuse in the context of occult or satanic rituals. In its most extreme form, the allegations involved a conspiracy of a global satanic cult whose members consisted of the wealthy and powerful world elite. This group was accused of breeding children for human sacrifices and child pornography. The FBI, however, never found evidence of this or even evidence of satanic cults communicating with each other. There was no organization of these practitioners. This makes me think of the Salem witch trials or McCarthyism with people becoming so wrapped up in the hysteria that they lost all reasoning and logic. A scary side effect of all of this was that many adults whose professions were tied to interactions with children were arrested, even jailed, without a trial based on mere accusations. Many innocent people were ruined by these outrageous claims. Believe it or not, the concept of an organized, global, satanic, child-abusing cult turned out to be all nonsense, based on the deranged minds of a few mentally ill people and their overzealous and wildly imaginative enablers, some of whom were psychotherapists. After Susan Polk came to the conclusion that her son, Adam, was a victim of Satanists, she would drive him around their hometown, asking him to point out the pedophiles from the alleged satanic group. She interpreted any babbled response from her 18-month-old son to be proof of guilt. And she even publicly accused a famous nature photographer of being a member of a satanic pedophile cult. Incredibly, Felix supported his wife's claims, maintaining he too had observed signs of abuse in Adam's behavior. Felix publicly proclaimed that his own son, Adam, had been victimized by a satanic cult. Although he had no proof of this, and an FBI investigation into the claims found nothing, Felix still claimed that his preschool-age son had witnessed numerous children being raped, consumed, and buried alive. He said that Adam alone had survived and lived to tell the tale. Given that Adam was a toddler at the time, it is remarkable to think that he was able to relay all of this specific information to Felix. Susan and Felix established a group of concerned activist parents called Enough. The couple organized rallies denouncing the pedophiles and demanding political legislation to protect the children. 
Susan was even interviewed in the local newspapers about the so-called satanic threat. Felix even had then-five-year-old Adam on stage with him at a public presentation in 1988. At this event, he claimed that Adam not only witnessed multiple unspeakable acts, but that he, too, was sodomized by Satanists. Reportedly, the boy smiled and nodded his head as his father held him up to the audience. There is a reason why we no longer condone images or details about a child's abuse to be made public. As a psychologist, Felix must have known that exploiting his child in such a way could have ramifications for his son later in life. To me, it shows that Felix only wanted to increase his own popularity and that he had no problems using his children as he had once used Susan as an endorsement for how wonderful a therapist he was. According to the book Seduced by Madness by Susan Pogosh, a friend of Susan's from college said that Susan, and I quote, strenuously objected to Felix's use of cocaine, which he had snorted during his grad school days and continued to use for years afterward. Cocaine has a long history of abuse among psychotherapists. One prominent example was Sigmund Freud, who penned some of his best-known theories about the unconscious mind while high on cocaine. But Felix's reaction to the drug was less fruitful. Susan complained that when he was high, Felix sometimes actually hallucinated and became impotent. And it's true, cocaine can have that effect on men. Eventually, Susan had two more sons, Eli and Gabriel. On a family trip to Disneyland in 1998, Susan had a very public breakdown in front of all three of her children. She sobbed uncontrollably because she suddenly remembered that her brother had beaten her up and her father had molested her as a child. Felix tried to console her and explained to their confused sons that their mother had a very traumatic childhood and was now remembering things. This epiphany was the result of Felix's adoption of the repressed memory concept. In this theory, a lack of memories or crucial events suggests that there are repressed memories in the subconscious. However, According to family members, the majority of Susan's recollections were found not to be credible. She had a delusional disorder, and that affected her interpretation of the world. At Susan's trial, the prosecutor, reading to the jury from the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fourth edition, also known as the DSM-4, claimed that Susan suffered from persecutory delusional disorder. Although, oddly enough, no qualified expert took the stand to confirm that diagnosis. Let's look at that disorder. According to the latest DSM-5, Delusional disorder is an illness characterized by at least one month of delusions, but no other psychotic symptoms. So what exactly is a delusion? It is an intensely strong false belief that persists despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And the delusion is unshakable. As a psychiatric nurse, I worked with many patients over the years who suffered from psychotic delusions. 
In episode 11 of Killer Psyche, we discuss Richard Chase, also known as the Sacramento Vampire Killer. I explained his bizarre delusion that his blood was turning to dirt and that he could only survive by replacing it with another person's blood. This delusion led him to commit five murders. That is known as a psychotic delusion. Psychotic means out of touch with reality. However, there are other types of delusions that are far less extreme. For example, non-bizarre delusions are about situations that actually could occur in real life, such as being followed or persecuted, or being loved romantically by someone, like a celebrity, or having a specific medical disorder, or lastly, being deceived by one's romantic partner, and that is known as irrational jealousy. Bizarre delusions like the vampire killers are clearly implausible and are frequently accompanied by hallucinations, such as hearing voices that are not real. But let me be clear. Non-bizarre delusions are not real or true but they are totally real to the individual who believes them. There are also cases where these delusions are somewhat based in reality, but have become highly exaggerated in the individual's mind. Persecutory delusional disorder, which the prosecutor declared was Susan's problem, was previously known as paranoid disorder. This is a serious mental illness in which a person cannot tell what is real from what is imagined. This subtype pertains to individuals with delusions where they believe they are being conspired against, spied or cheated on, poisoned or drugged, harassed or followed, or generally obstructed in the pursuit of their goals. In many ways, that description for Susan is right on target. After all, at one point she claimed that her parents had killed someone with a hammer and that her mother was not her mother. Susan made her mother take a DNA test to prove their genetic relationship. However, she still did not completely believe the positive results. That doesn't surprise me. Remember, for the delusional person, their delusion is unshakable. But what if Susan's beliefs, or some of them, were 100% true? Does that negate the diagnosis of persecutory delusional disorder? No, it does not. And if we believe some of her claims, and I do... Does that mean we should believe all of them? No, it does not. And what if Felix had his own agenda and really was manipulating his wife in such a way that she believed everything he said, no matter how outrageous? It appears to me that is exactly what he did, starting when she was only 15 years old and began to see him for psychological help. All three of the Polk boys were intelligent, handsome, and athletic. They were also very popular with their classmates. However, they did not comprehend how unusual their mother's behavior and their father's response to it appeared to the outside world. Unfortunately, Susan did not enforce much discipline. As the children grew, she imposed very few barriers on their behavior. She would allow them to skip school. And if they got into trouble, it was always the teacher's fault. At some point, each of them was suspended for fighting. Later, Eli, the middle child, was arrested and incarcerated for assault and placed in a detention center for teenagers. Susan convinced Eli that his father had persuaded the authorities to incarcerate him. 
Of the three Polk sons, Eli was the closest to Susan and believed the story she fed him, which resulted in Eli hating his father. This is not to excuse any of Felix's behavior. He would point out to his sons that their mother was mentally ill and they should not take her seriously. He still treated Susan as if she were his 15-year-old patient, and that was beginning to wear her down. Susan felt that she was trapped in the relationship and that Felix would never allow her to leave. She claims he threatened to kill her or himself if she left. Felix's belief in Susan's recovered memories and his encouragement that she continue to uncover more ultimately backfired on him. Susan began to feel that she had been manipulated into loving Felix and that perhaps she did not really love him at all. On the morning of her 40th birthday in 1997, she woke up and asked him what the exact date was that they first had sex. This question developed into Susan having recovered memories of being hypnotized, drugged, and raped by Felix when she was his 15-year-old patient. Armed with this revelation, Susan threatened to inform the school where Felix taught, the professional board that accredited him, and all of his patients, essentially destroying his life and career. Felix was at a loss about what to do. He did not want the information that he'd had an illicit, unethical, and illegal affair with his teenage patient to become public knowledge. He also did not want to admit that his wife, who he once held up as his prized patient, was paranoid, delusional, and beyond his ability to help. After all, as we talked about in episode one, he had supposedly, quote, cured her of her schizophrenia years before. Susan's mental state quickly deteriorated. She told anyone who would listen that she was a psychic and had predicted the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Susan stated that she had passed this information on to Felix, whom she insisted was a member of the Israeli intelligence agency, Mossad. But she claimed that Felix only alerted the Israelis, not the United States government. Gabriel would later say on the witness stand that every Saturday, his mother would try to, quote, find codes in the newspaper that secret agents had put there. In January 2001, she took a trip alone to Yosemite. Susan ingested a bottle of aspirin and then called Felix. He alerted 911 and she was taken to a hospital. Again, like when she was 15, Felix had hospital administrators release her to his custody. In November of 2001, Susan filed for divorce. Eli and Gabriel wrote letters to the court expressing their desire to live with their mother. However, after Eli was arrested for assault in February of 2002, Susan changed her mind about custody. She informed Felix's lawyer that she was relinquishing all rights to her children. Felix ignored her knowing that given her mercurial nature, it would be only a matter of weeks till she would reverse that decision. And of course, she did. In the fall of 2002, while Susan was away in Montana, she became enraged to hear Gabriel say nice things about his father. She felt that Felix had already convinced her older son that she was delusional. So she wanted to return home to ensure that he would not get to her youngest son as well. At the same time, Susan found out that Felix had gotten full custody of the boys 
and that her alimony settlement had been substantially cut by 75%, effectively leaving her unable to support herself. Infuriated, she told Felix that she was going to kill him. A neighbor claimed that Felix called him the day before the murder and told him that he had just gotten off the phone with his soon-to-be ex-wife. According to the neighbor, Felix, quote, said that Susan called him, said she was in Montana, and she was coming back to kill him. And I said, have you called the police? He said, I told Susan I wouldn't. I said, Felix, you want to live? Yes. Then you call the police. This is not a joke. And it obviously was not a joke, since Felix was murdered in the middle of the early morning the next day. On October 14, 2002, the night when Gabriel called the police and reported that his mother had murdered his father, Susan was shocked. She had not considered that Gabriel would not back her claims of self-defense. For all of her brilliance, Susan did not understand that by murdering their father, she effectively destroyed her relationship with her sons. When police arrived at the Polk family home on October 14th, they separated Susan and Gabriel. Gabriel was initially interviewed as a suspect, but police quickly eliminated him. He recounted the events leading up to the murder, including his mother's constant threats. For four years, Susan had talked about drowning Felix, drugging him, hitting him with her car, and shooting him. Sitting in the interrogation room, Gabriel still believed his mother had carried through with her threat to shoot his father. Cameras recorded his phone conversation with his older brother, Adam. Gabriel told him, and I quote, the crazy bitch shot him. Of course, she did not shoot him. She hit him on the back of the head and stabbed him. 27 times. But the sentiment remained that her children thought that she was mentally ill and knew that she had killed him. After Susan was arrested, Adam took charge of family matters and placed Gabriel with a family friend. Susan initially was grateful to them, but weeks later, she turned on the family accusing them of embezzling money from the Polk Family Trust. She also believed that they influenced Gabriel against her. The brothers reported that this was common behavior for their mother. She would initially be warm to someone and then accuse them of conspiring against her. That description perfectly fits someone suffering from persecutory delusional disorder. Felix's twin brother hired a lawyer to oversee the assets in the estate. However, Susan used the money to control her sons. When Adam needed to use her car to drive to his summer job, she only agreed to do so if he would remove Gabriel from the family he was living with. In October of 2004, Adam and Gabriel filed a wrongful death suit against their mother. They wanted money for their school tuition and living expenses. Susan threatened that if they did not end the lawsuit, she would spend down all of the assets. This is exactly what they feared she was already doing. In the end, they were awarded only $300,000. This from an estate that before the murder was estimated to be worth $5 million. For two days after the murder, Susan denied killing Felix. Later, when police and her lawyers explained the mounting forensic evidence against her, she changed course to say it was self-defense. 
She stuck with this argument throughout her trial, even though there had been a history of her threats and a police report four days prior to the murder. What she would not agree to was any defense based on insanity. The trial for the murder of Felix Polk began in the spring of 2007. It became a media circus. Susan went through lawyer after lawyer until she decided finally to represent herself. There's a saying that when a person decides to represent themselves, they have a fool for a client. I believe this statement to be very apropos in Susan's case. Surprisingly, Susan was capable of sowing doubt in the prosecutor's case against her. She pointed out that the police investigation had failed to definitively identify which knife in the kitchen was the murder weapon. She found a pathologist who testified that Felix's undiagnosed heart disease was actually the cause of his death, not the stab wounds, as if the jury would overlook the 27 stabs. She lessened the prosecutor's pathologist's claims that the wounds were significant enough to be the cause of death. She also pushed the narrative that Felix was abusive and addicted to cocaine, although no one would corroborate either claim. Susan called for a mistrial almost daily. She objected to the prosecutor so often and continued speaking after the judge overruled her so many times that the judge removed her from the courtroom. She also insulted and taunted the prosecutor, calling him a frat boy, a liar, and believe it or not, a crybaby. The prosecutor later stated that he had never met a more hateful person and that Susan had effectively worn him down. Susan provoked the judge, prosecutor, and witnesses, but then seemed baffled about why they responded to her with anger. She was also unprepared for how angry her sons were with her. Two of her sons, Gabriel and Adam, both testified for the prosecution. Eli was the only one to testify for the defense. Susan questioned them for days on the witness stand, trying to get them to admit that it was their domineering and controlling father who was mentally unfit. She seemed to object more to being labeled delusional than anything else. That doesn't surprise me. But here's the thing about a delusion. It's not just a passing thought. It's woven into the fabric of the individual's brain, personality, everything. For them to accept that they are truly delusional would mean everything they thought and everything that guided their behavior didn't exist. Susan was her own worst enemy. Her claims that Felix was a member of the Mossad and a traitor to the United States underscored that she was both paranoid and delusional. The jury concluded that while Felix had violated boundaries between therapist and patient, Susan was responsible for murdering Felix. Remember, the victim was not on trial for his prior bad acts. Felix was not on trial for seducing Susan as a child. Ultimately, Susan was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 16 years to life. She became eligible for parole in 2019, but it was denied. You probably won't be surprised to hear that Susan argued with every member of the parole board and eventually had to be removed. Currently, Susan May Polk is incarcerated in the California Institution for Women in Chino, California. She will be eligible for parole again in 2029. Next week on Killer Psyche, Joseph Edward Duncan.
From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Edited by Joshua Morales and Maxwell Carney. With research and editing assistance from Ann Liu. Our senior audio producer is Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is production manager. And Haley Mandelberg is production coordinator. Brandon Clark and Lindsay Whistler are production assistants. And the line producer is Oscar Guido. Our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. <laughs>